Berserkers. These infamous Viking warriors fought like madmen in a trance-like state of fury that struck fear into the hearts of their enemies. But why did they act in this way? Why were they associated with wolves and bears? And where does this tradition ultimately come from? I'm Dan Davis, I'm a novelist, and on this channel we talk about the real history behind my historical fantasy stories. And this is the story of the first berserkers. We're travelling to the Eurasian steppe and going back 5,000 years to the time of the Kurios. These ancient warbands changed the world and influenced every descendant Indo-European culture from Ireland to India. And to understand the origins of the Berserker, we need to understand the nature of these Indo-European warbands. They were formed by the adolescent boys of the tribe or clan or village or polis, depending on exactly which Indo-European culture we're talking about. But the principles are the same, though the specifics might differ. The Chorios was the final part of the long transition from boyhood to manhood. Although the Chorios itself might last only half a year, the training would have started before puberty and continued up until the cusp of manhood. This might have been at the age of 16 or even later, at the age of 20 or 21 in some cultures. Once the test of the Chorios was over, the boy could transition into becoming a man. To do so fully, he had to own property, that is physical wealth either in land or in cattle, and then he could take a wife and start his own household as a man of the tribe. There is a certain tension between the adult men of a tribe and the adolescent boys who are not yet men. There is the Chorios, and then there is the tribe, the people who define the tribe. And by the people, I mean the adult males, and not the women, children, servants or slaves. The tribe is the adult warriors, including the men who once were warriors, but who are now too old. It was specifically men who possessed a certain amount of property and were married. The youths of the Chorios are the opposite of the men of the tribe. They are not yet men. They are unmarried. They do not have property and they have no family of their own. The men of the tribe are obvious by their clothing and their hairstyles, shorn or braided or knotted in a specific way, while the boys of the Chorios wear their hair wild, uncut and unkempt, and what beards they have are unshorn, and they are naked but for the wolf skin, or dog skin or bear skin, draped over his shoulders and tied in place by a leather belt. This animal skin was not some sort of disguise meant to trick onlookers into believing they saw an animal instead of a youth. The skin was symbolic, and it could have been a whole skin with the human face looking out of the animal's open jaws, or it could have been even less than that, a wolfskin cloak or even just a hood. Another great distinction is the fact that the men are of the village, while the youths are of the forest. The distinction between here and there home and not home, is vitally important in understanding the mindset of these people. It is the distinction between law and anarchy. This division helps us to understand what has happened when the youths of the Chorios are expelled from home. They no longer have a place, physically or metaphysically. The married, propertied men have a place in the social order. The women too, because they are part of someone's household as a daughter, a wife or a widowed mother, and the children too belong in a household. But the Chorios youth is no longer a part of anyone's household, and has none of his own. The terms village and forest should not be taken literally. The village may be the camp of the pastoralists and so will change to wherever the wagons are drawn up and the tents pitched. And the forest may not be a woodland, it could be the grassland or the desert, or mountains or the bogland. The point is, it is the wild lands beyond where ordinary living takes place. This is where the Chorios youths must go. And it is there that they live by hunting and trapping and by preying on the other peoples of the world. The men of the tribe hunted too of course, but it had a different 
quality. The men would hunt in a large group in daytime, chasing a deer or a boar through the woodlands or hills, corralling them and shooting them or throwing or thrusting their spears. The author Christian Cameron does a, an amazing job showing these kinds of hunts in his novel series of ancient Greece called The Long War. But the Koryos hunts in the darkness with nets and snares, alone or in small groups using stealth and deception. Like a cunning animal himself, he stalks and ambushes his prey. And the youth fights on the battlefield in a similar way too. When the men of the tribe or village or polis go out to fight, the adolescent boys, if called upon, would go ahead of the lines and skirmish dressed in their animal skins, using stealth and throwing rocks and spears, harassing and demoralising the enemy with their wildness and ecstatic animal fury. So why did they wear the animal skins? This is absolutely crucial to the Koryos. The essential part of the military initiation consisted in ritually transforming the young warrior into some species of predatory wild animal. We might imagine that this was done to assume the animal's strength and endurance, its fearsomeness and fearlessness, but it was far more than that. It was a truly transformative, religious, ecstatic experience. The young warrior's humanity was transmuted into an aggressive and terrifying fury, the like of which is seen only in the raging carnivore, in the wild predator. These animals are invariably the wolf and the bear. There are indications of other transformations in Indo-European cultures, mainly the dog, which is treated in almost exactly the same way as the wolf. The boar, too, was closely associated with warriors for thousands of years. And there are also horse cults. The horse was incredibly important to these cultures, and it was possible to access the powers of other animals, but they are different to the canids and bears, which are the animals of the warrior bands, wolves especially, it seems. The young warrior did not just become a wolf, though, by donning its skin. He was not simply a wolf that you might observe from afar, padding across the steps and slinking between shadowy trees. He became a ravening beast, fearless of death and injury, and entirely immune to pain and he fought in an ecstatic state. Sometimes they consumed sacred substances to help bring about this ecstatic state. Most obviously, perhaps, there is the sacred Soma that Indra and his warriors drank before going into battle. But in other places and times, they drank mead, or beer, or wine, or other substances. And the ecstatic state can be reached by prolonged war dances and battle songs that would slowly drive the participants into a battle fury. In my novel Godborn, the warriors consume a kind of soma, and they chant themselves into that higher state of being, led by an experienced war master. They sat together in a circle and passed the bowl of koidos around, each taking a sip. Hercules drank. It tasted earthy and sweet, and he knew there was mead and milk and honey and the sacred mushroom within. It warmed his belly by the time he passed the bowl on, and soon he felt it spreading through his limbs and into his eyes. The others around him gasped and looked at their hands and flexed their limbs, their eyes shining with joy. Come, Herculos said standing, let us dance the spear dance. Taking up their weapons, they chanted the words of the dance, stepping and thrusting their spears as one, turning and striking again and again. Hercules' heart raced as he slipped from one form into another, flowing through the maneuvers as he never had before. Around him, the others did the same. All of them now danced with precise rhythm, as if they were a single being with many limbs. When the dance was completed, they stood in silent wonder at their new abilities. It brings on the wolf spirit, Macross said, his voice deep in the darkness. My ancestors were within me. I feel them still. Never have I stepped into the wolf skin with such ease. In battle, there are some warriors who lose themselves in the fighting. The spirits of the ancestors possess him, and he fights without thought, without his own will. In my clan, I led the chance for my spear brothers and the young men of the Koryos to help them to give up their spirits. He nodded at Herculos. There are a few warriors who slip into the wolf skin every time they fight. 
With others, it comes upon us when we fight for our lives, when our ancestors deem us worthy. For most of us, we must sing their spirits down before battle is joined. But this kudos, it's as though a door is opened and the ancestor spirit slips straight through. Before we talk about these experienced older warriors, these, these first berserkers, we have to take a moment to talk about the gods. The youths of the Chorios were sworn to the god of the Chorios. In my series I call him the Wolf God and give him the name Kolnos, which means one-eyed in Proto-Indo-European. We don't know much about the real god of the Chorios, but we know that he wasn't one-eyed. I just gave him that trait to bring to mind that other, far later, one-eyed god, Odin, who was himself a god of the warband. So the boys were sworn to the god of the Chorios, while the men of the tribe were sworn to their own chief god of the tribe, and to the tribe's war god when it was the time of war. The Chorios was devoted to their leader, the Chorionos, and also to the god of the Chorios. Their actions, all of their actions during the time of the Chorios, were a kind of devotion to that god. The stealth, the hunting, the stealing and cattle rustling was done in dedication to the god of the Chorios, and then, when they became men, they were no longer in that ritual state of devotion. There was a final ritual where they removed their wolf skin and cut their hair and were ritually cleansed and welcomed back into the tribe. So bear that in mind while we talk about the berserker. There were some men who were more warlike than the others, and instead of becoming men of the tribe, they spent their whole lives in devotion to the god. Instead of taking a wife, owning land or cattle, raising his sons, guiding his people from within, this man was overcome by the pull of the wild. He continued to live in a state of wildness, not cutting his hair and fighting naked or perhaps wearing only the clothing and armor he won in battle. The life of the wolf was too powerful to give up. The wolf inside him would not let go. Later in the Bronze Age, when growing militarization led to the development of professional warriors, these were the kinds of men who would become, in effect, mercenaries, guarding the caravans and trade routes from the Baltic to the Mediterranean, and serving the lords and kings who could pay them their due. Tacitus says the following about this kind of Germanic warrior. Theirs is the first thrust of every fight. Always theirs the first line of battle. A strange thing to see, for not even in peace do they grow gentle with a softer appearance. None has a house or field or anything to care for. By whomever they visit are they fed, profligate of others' goods, contemptuous of their own till pale old age renders them unequal to such harsh heroics." End quote. Because the tradition, in one form or another, in some places more than others, continued through the Iron Age and the Classical Age and into the medieval period. This is where berserkers appear in the Germanic sagas and poems. Often they are shown as the bodyguards, the elite warriors and the champions of their kings. But they are also shown as violent boasters and bullies rather than the shining heroes of their own tales, and as ravenous men who loot, plunder and kill indiscriminately. Indeed, it is as if the normal rules of conduct do not apply to them at all, because they dwell metaphysically beyond the realm of men, even if they are physically within it. There is no doubt that the later Viking tradition, so familiar to us, in fact describes these kinds of men. Imbued with the savagery of beasts, dedicated to the god of the warband, wild and uncontrollable in an ecstatic rage of violence. Berserks bellowed. This was their battle. Wolfskins shrieked and shook their weapons. These wild warriors are howling with the spirits of the bears and wolves that have filled their bodies. Odin's own men went about without armour and were mad like hounds or wolves and bit their shields and were strong as bears and bulls. 
They slew men, but neither fire nor steel could deal with them. This was called a berserker gang. These men might dedicate themselves to the god for their entire lives, or some men could do so for a specific time, until a specific goal had been achieved. Tacitus tells the story of the Batavian revolt under Civilis. On the day he took up arms against Rome, Civilis vowed not to cut his hair until he had destroyed the Roman legions. When he slaughtered the 5th and 15th legions, he cut his hair. He had also dyed his hair red, which was a custom amongst the Germanic warriors. This red-gold hair colour was closely associated with the warrior spirit. The importance of the devotion of a man's hair to the god is seen in the saga of the famous king, who swore not to cut or comb his hair until he had become king of all Norway. After ten years of struggle and conquest, when he had made himself king of all the land and so fulfilling his oath, he was ritually washed and his hair was cut and so cleansed he became Harold Fairhair. The older man, the war master, the ecstatic cultic warrior who could not let go of the wolf, was not only a wild thing and a bully and a drain on the society he clung to from the outside. He either died in battle or he grew to become an experienced warrior who would slay his chief's enemies when required. And when it was not the time of battle, he could be employed in other ways. Primarily, at least in the most ancient times, as a teacher of the young. They were not part of the tribe, yet they were integral to its continuation, and not just by defending it in battle. In our ancestral societies, the boys began their training in prepubescent childhood, and spent seasons out in the wilderness learning stealthiness and hunting and trapping. Sometimes they would do so in a group and sometimes one to one with an older man. It is not only the practical skills that were taught by the old to the young. The boys had to learn all the law of their people. They had to memorize every right, the laws and taboos, and the names and deeds of their ancestors and the gods. They had to learn and perform ritual poetry and prophecy. These things were, of course, not for the eyes and ears of the women and young children, nor for the servants and slaves, nor were they for the ordinary places of home and village. The boys would go into the wilds for periods with their battle-scarred, half-wolf war masters for a night or a moon before returning again and again all the way through their childhood until it was time for their curios. And when it came time for the next generation of youths to transition to manhood, there would always be a select few who could not cease their devotion to the god and to the wilderness inside them and around them. And it was these wolf men and bear men who were the first berserkers. A huge thank you to my patrons. To support the channel and join the Order of the White Dagger, the link to my Patreon is in the description, as are links to my novels on Amazon and Audible. Please do subscribe to the channel and check out the playlist for more content like this. Thank you for watching.